Hello, my YouTube friends. Have I got a big old pile of crap to show you today. So this is a briefcase looking thing. Look at that handle. Look at this. This is a laptop computer. Well, I tell a lie. It, it, it was the closest thing you could get to a laptop computer in the early 1970s. What this is, is a, uh, upside down, you can read, Texas Instruments Silent 700 Portable Data Terminal. Which means, uh, if you've ever worked under uh, Unix or Linux and you've seen a serial terminal described as a TTY, uh, well, this is a TTY. This is the TTY when it's at home. This is one I got a couple of years ago on eBay because I wanted to have a real genuine TTY to play with. I wanted a dot matrix one, couldn't find any. So this one was available for a decent price and the uh, seller uh, had, uh, yeah, had good shipping. So this thing uh, does weigh a lot and it takes a lot to ship, but I got it. So this is obviously not the terminal itself. This is the uh, outside case. What makes mine interesting is it has these nifty casket locks on the side and unlike a lot of the silence that I see, because these casket locks are only, they're not metal, they're plastic, uh, they almost always fatigue and tear off, uh, which is why when this is in storage I don't leave the casket locks engaged, but for the video I am, but I've got all four of my casket locks there. And I have my handle, which is still uh, wrapped in whatever 1970s grime was there. Let's pop this bugger open. Look at the glory. Look at the glory. Oh. My other thing I want to show is uh, the camera's not picking it up good, but uh, so this is the, uh, the color of the plastic on the outside. But when you look at it on the inside, you can see it's uh, it's got the same problem that almost all plastics from that era do, it had. It's gone yellow. Not too terrible in this one, but it has gone fairly yellow, you can see. Other interesting thing on the inside of this cover is there's a place to wind your power cord. Um, one of the clips on mine is broken, so I don't use this anymore, obviously, because I have so many power cords I don't care about, and I don't want to break any other ones off, so I won't use it. But that's what they thought of. They thought, oh, we're going to give you a place to wind your power cord. Good thinking. Boom, look at the majesty of this thing. So, Silent 700. Yeah, this model is, as you can see on the top, is a 745. There were various models in the 700 series that all had different capabilities. Some uh, had modem, some didn't, some had uh, keyboards, some didn't, some had printers, some didn't. You could mix and match whatever you wanted. But this one's mine with the crack and all. That's not mine. That happened a long time ago. Here is our uh, logo. Every Silent 700 series I've seen has a plaque here. Now this is just the person who was selling it uh, or servicing at the time, the service contract with it. And other ones you see on the internet will have a similar thing that says whatever company is responsible for servicing it. Just like you got on old typewriters where you had uh, typewriter servicing stickers on them back if you ever used typewriters. And I've been tempted to call this number. I should look it up. Uh, it says, if you couldn't see that, Data Access Systems Inc. 100 Route 46, Mountain Lakes, New Jersey. I don't know why I did a stupid New Jersey accent. I apologize, everybody from New Jersey. Your life is hard enough living in New Jersey. You don't need me making fun of your accent. Uh, and uh, there's a phone number there, which probably goes to some poor person's cell phone right now. Uh, who picks up the phone anyway? Because it's all, uh, all robocalls. Anyway, let's get to work. Let's take a look at this thing. I got this partly because I really like the uh, look at this keyboard. You kind of hear it. Uh, when you look at the uh, the entry on sites like Desk Authority, that's the big one, they have a version of this, but it's an older version, an older production model of this. And while their keyboard has Hall FX switches, this fella, let's see if we can get you close, right there in the middle. Oh, that was the wrong key to pull. There we go. You can see instead those are two uh, uh, fingers and they just make contact. And the key switch in this case is referred to, that is a, that key switch is referred to as a high-tech, H-I-T-E-K, high-tech dovetail switch. Uh, the other silence did use high-tech key switches as well, but they used uh, more tactile Hall effect switches than, this was the, the cost-limited uh, dovetail switch, obviously easier to make with springs versus a bunch of magnets and Hall effect sensors. 
Let's take a look down the keyboard, what we've got here. Boom. <sighs> Keyboards used to be simple ones. Look at that. Amongst the things that are missing from here, um, we've got no caps lock, just the way that God intended. Caps lock has no place on a keyboard. We also have a control key where caps lock would be if you were a terrible human being and he has a caps lock key on your keyboard. This is where control is supposed to go. It's right there. What we don't have is we don't have a tab key. We have an escape key where most people would be used to finding it either by the one or up on a function row. So we've got that in place. Shift where we'd normally expect on either side. A big old fat space bar, which so with surprisingly good action, it's stabilized with a big wire stabilizer, which is good. Let's get my, let's get the camera a little bit closer here. I wanna, I wanna just uh, show, whoa, too much spring. Too much spring on the camera, there we go. There we go, let me release some tension, there we go. Now we can show it off. Uh, these are double shot keycaps. I'm guessing from the feel, they are ABS plastic. They're pretty shiny, but uh, the legends are all still beautiful, still crisp. They're wonderful to look at. The thing you might notice uh, if you're using a North American ANSI keyboard or a European ISO keyboard, uh, the parentheses will look like they're on the wrong keys. Uh, that's because this uses a, a bit paired keyboard layout versus the typewriter style layout that we're used to now. If you're using a, a Japanese JIS keyboard, this, this totally makes sense because that's also where they are still there today. Uh, the we have a plus here. The legends in the in the negative and the dark black. That's for the numerical keypad mode. So we just ignore those. Let me move the light a little bit so we don't get so much shine. There we go. Uh, the other keys that have moved around are most of them. We've got our asterisk and our colon there. We've got our at sign here. Uh, our plus and our semicolon over there. Uh, our braces and our slashes and everything like that are all jumped around. Uh, something it's missing, but I think it can do, is uh, there should be a bell uh, command on the on the G, and it might not be shown, uh, but usually you would do uh, control G would be the bell, and it would make a beep or something like that. I need to try that out. <clears throat> the fun keys over here are the ones which you would never expect. Um, so we've got a return, but we've also got a separate line feed. If you've done computer work for any amount of time getting into the bits and pieces, you'll know about uh, the line feeds, the line ending characters will have uh, uh, old, old style Macintosh, we would use one kind and uh, Unix uses another and MS-DOS uses another. And uh, they call the, the one that uh, Unix uses is called CRLF. CR stands for carriage return, LF stands for line feed. Carriage return, line feed. Whereas other computers only use carriage return or the other did line feed or in a different order. But this is, these are the, the real article, we have care to turn, we have line feed, boom. Uh, we have rub out, which is kind of like a backspace. I haven't looked into it uh, ex uh, really exhaustively, but I think it's it's a uh, it's a backspace. Of course, it won't be able to erase it on the printed uh, content because this is coming out on paper, but it will at least move your cursor back on the remote terminal. Repeat key, this has no automatic repeat, so if you hold down a key, it'll just register it once. If you want to repeat, you then hold it down, and then it repeats immediately. So not no holding it down and waiting for the repeat, it's just like that, and boom, you're repeating. You just go the whole line, boom. Uh, we've got paper advance, which is exactly what it does. Um, it advances the paper. Break sends a break signal. Uh, if you've used a terminal program, you may have seen something that says like, uh, command to send a break, and this is the physical version of that command. Something to note about these keys is the springs are a lot heavier on these two than they are on the remainder of the keys. They are probably, they feel like they're 80 or 90 gram force, whereas these are probably somewhere like 50 grams for the rest of the, of the keys. Finally, we have a here is key. This is also a heavier key. Uh, the here is, I had to look up and it's meant to uh, announce a remote station uh, to tell uh, the person on the other end who you are. And uh, what would happen here is if you got the right configuration, the right ROMs, is you could press here is and would print out your terminal identification string, whatever that would be, maybe who you are, your department, whatever that was. Instead of having to type it all out, you'd be able to do that and it would just boom, print it out. There you go. Finally, we've got some switches over here. 
uh, low speed versus high speed. This is great. This terminal is a high speed, high speed. You can see my air quotes, my close up air quotes. Uh, when it's in low speed, it is uh, running at a 110 baud, which depending on your, your settings is uh, about 10 characters per second, characters per second. But switching that over there, that engages the turbo mode and that gets you to 300 baud, 300 baud. That is 30 characters per second, three, zero, 30 characters per second, amazing. Uh, half duplex or full duplex, uh, duplex if uh, you're unaware, it means can both sides talk at the same time or does one side have to stop talking while the other one is talking? For older computer systems or uh, low quality lines, you might have to go half duplex versus full duplex. Obviously full duplex is faster because you can type while you're receiving, but uh, not everything supported that. Finally, the online key which when we hook this up to a computer and get it going, which we are going to do, uh, you get this will, uh, it's like the local echo of a terminal program, if you're familiar with that, where when online is uh, on, it will echo keys back to you generally, and when it's off, it won't. Uh, we've got a light here, which is not, this is not a power light. This is the online light. When there's a carrier detected on the acoustic coupler modem, which we'll get to in a moment, or on the serial port, this will go on, and also if this is if this online switch is on, this will go on to show you that there's a remote terminal connected, but it's not a power switch. And there's a reason because it needs a power switch because this thing is so loud, you know it's on. Uh, the final switch we have over here is a numlock key, which I talked about over here in the number legends. So you can turn this into a numeric keypad by switching numlock, and then you've got your numeric keypad that becomes zero when we've got all of these. And still, return enter is all the way over there, which is irritating. But what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Really? There's one version of this of this terminal that I really would like to find, and it's mentioned in the service manual. I've never been able to find it, which was a Japanese version, which had a kanji keyboard. So instead of a numeric uh, keypad switch, switching this would switch the mode from doing either standard uh, English to Japanese kanji. Uh, sorry, uh, not kanji. I've misspoke katakana, and I would love to find one of those, but I've never ever even seen a picture of one outside of the uh, the service manual and the marketing material. So I don't even know if they were ever purchased or exist or anything like that. Let's flip this gizmo around to the back and take a look at these big, beautiful cups. And I know that sounds salacious as supposed to. Uh, I don't have a telephone handset to show you, but this is an acoustic coupler. You, you can Google it if you want to know what this is. So back before we had, well, when we had modems, but, but back before we had modems that would actually just plug in with the phone jack, uh, you would place the telephone handset right there and the, the two uh, parts of the handset would plug right there and you would have an acoustic connection, hence acoustic coupler, to the telephone uh, system. So we've got a, a receiver, I believe, and a microphone here. I'm not quite sure. Maybe they reversed it like that. And uh, so you would uh, dial your number by hand, and when you started hearing the tone on the other side, you'd quickly go and you'd set it in the coupler and then turn the online switch to on, and this would, would pick up. And I've n that's even too old for me. I've never, been, uh, I've never been old enough to actually need to use an acoustic coupler, but I have hooked this up to a sound card and been able to send tones to it, so maybe we'll try that too as a, as a stretch goal. And around the back, let's take a look. So we've got our serial number here. I don't know how the serial numbers correlate with others of these I have seen online. Um, this one seems to be a lower serial number than others I've seen, but I can tell by the build codes inside, which we'll take a look at in a moment. Uh, this is made later, so the serial number total might not have a direct correlation. I haven't tested the power consumption, but boy howdy, that's a lot of power consumption. My goodness, 75 watts. My goodness. Uh, and of course the power cycle, which they had to list back then because just reasons. Um, it's UL certified, and we've got an IEA uh, serial port connector, which is uh, RS-232 compatible with the right adapter, which uh, we'll talk about later. Now we are ready to take a look at the inside of this venerable old teletype. I've already taken the screws out and I want to point out something with these screws. 
Uh, they're nothing special at first. They are SAE number four screws with a 40 thread pattern. Uh, they're about seven eighths of an inch long, but they are, you can see this, uh, slotted screws. I have not seen slotted screws in electronics past anything made maybe 1980. So this thing is of course old, so you'd expect that, but I really hate working with slotted screws because your screwdriver always cams out and you always strip these out and I hate them. I would have replaced them with Phillips head screws the moment I got this if this wasn't a collectible item. So I've got to stick with those slotted screws now, but this tells you how old this thing is that they were still using slotted screws because nobody uses slotted screws pretty much for anything anymore. And with that, we got the cover coming off. Speaking of screws, I want to point something out that is good about the screws. Let's get one of these metal uh, things here. So you can see right where my finger is. This is where the screws thread into from when you put them into the bottom. And the screws are not threading into just bare plastic. This is, in fact, a uh, some sort of metal uh, pressed nut with metal threads in it so that you can tighten it and it won't end up stripping the plastic threads out like happens pretty much all the time when you're trying to thread plastic into or metal into plastic. So that is a really, uh, really great design and I wish companies still do that, but of course they don't because of cost. And while we're here, we gotta point something out. They, we've got a little bit of a build date stamped right here, May 29th, 1979. Now this is pretty fortuitous because I look at the calendar today and it is May 28th, 2019. So this tomorrow will be this teletype's 40th uh, birthday which means it's a little bit older than me. So good job, Teletype. If you've lasted this long, maybe I can last a little bit longer too. Happy birthday. And what better way to celebrate a birthday than being torn apart? So now we've got the main event, the insides. Our main keyboard assembly is here. The service manual says to get it out. You uh, grab the circuit board and then push it towards the back of the unit. I tried that and I felt like I was going to break something or rip the keycaps off or something like that and I just gave up. Instead I got some small jeweler screwdrivers and worked them into these three clips on the front and gently uh, wedged the keyboard out until it popped free. And I'd probably recommend anybody who's going to do this to do the same thing because the plastics get brittle over the years, you're not going to find any more of these clips and so be careful when you're taking this apart. So with that the keyboard comes off and I'm going to put it aside. The keyboard you can see is, there's a an edge connector, but it's not a traditional ribbon cable edge connector. There are, uh, these are discrete pins that go into some sort of an edge connector. So I'm not going to disconnect them because I'm afraid that if I disconnect them, I might uh, uh, tear off one of the ind individual pins or might not be able to get them back in the board, something like that. So I'm just going to leave it like that and just put it up out of the way so that we're not going to touch it. And unfortunately, it is soldered directly into the main board down here, so this cable uh, can't come out from that end either. So we'll be very careful with it and just not touch it. This is our main event now, and uh, I will try to get some of these chips up so that you can take a look at them, because some of them are pretty interesting. The first one, center of your screen, is the TMS-8080. Now, if you've worked on old computers, 8080 might sound familiar. In fact, it should because Intel made a little chip in the 1970s called the Intel 8080, and this was made on license by TI for Intel. They were a second source manufacturer, and that was very common for Intel to do in the 1970s and 80s and later on because they couldn't keep up with demand, so they licensed the IP to various manufacturers, TI, Fujitsu, AMD. AMD, fun fact, got its start uh, in the in the microprocessor business, uh, making chips on license from Intel. Uh, so this was a second source, but it is completely compatible with the Intel 8080. But that also means that it is binary compatible, not electrically compatible, but binary compatible with the Zilog Z80, the Intel 8085, and the Intel 8086. So this little chip here, this 40-year-old chip, um, is the DNA for all of the desktop computers that we use today. They all st still carry the, uh, the, the ancient uh, uh, DNA from that chip, which is pretty cool that we can still trace our lineage 40 some odd years later to that chip. Its companion right next to it, the, ne the next big one, center of your screen, it's called the TMS-5504 in this case. Now I couldn't find specifications on the TMS-5504, 
And when I looked at the service manual for this teletype, it in fact said that it needed, uh, it called for the TMS 5501. So my guess is this is a more, better, faster of the 5501, but completely compatible, obviously, because it's there. Uh, what is the 5501? The spec sheet says it provides uh, multifunction input output control for the TMS 8080 system. So this chip goes hand in hand with this chip. It was meant to be the support chip that uh, goes together. You can think of it like the Northbridge and Southbridge and a modern motherboard. And what this does is it gives uh, asynchronous communication, IO buffers, timers, interrupt logic, and things like that uh, so that the CPU doesn't have to deal with it. It has five programmable interrupt timers that can go down to a few microseconds up to several milliseconds. It has eight uh, dedicated input lines, eight dedicated output lines, and eight bidirectional lines that are meant to be uh, for the bus. In fact, the, uh, the text sheet for this calls them the bus IO lines, so that should be a clue that they are meant to interface with the system bus, duh. All right, let's take a look at the next big one. Uh, let's get this nice and in focus. Hey there, all right. Now you'll see that it says, can't read that. Let me check my notes. Okay, my notes say that is a ROM chip. So this is some sort of ROM, whatever. Um, it's the operating code for the system. It's the boot ROM, it's the BIOS, whatever you want to call it. And so it's just some sort of uh, ROM chip. And uh, then the one next to it, which is unpopulated here, just bare solder pads, the manual says that that is meant to be, see, is that U12? That's U14. Uh, that's for an additional ROM chip. So you could order this with various capabilities. And if you wanted other programming, they would put another ROM socket here so you could have twice the space. I don't know the specifications on this particular ROM chip, but if it's like some of the other ones I've seen of the same vintage, that means this has maybe 512 kilobytes of storage space, which is, uh, yeah. Sorry, not 512 kilobytes, 512 bits of storage, not kilobytes, kil bits, bits, one half kilobyte, pardon. My, uh, my age is getting to me. And then going, traveling around, our next interesting thing is we've got an unsocketed uh, socket or an unpopulated socket here. The manual says that that is going to be for a PROM socket, programmable ROM. You might also know it as EEPROM or EEPROM nowadays, but back then we didn't really have EEPROM because it was so expensive. So this is meant to be additional ROM uh, that is programmable by the user once. And in this case, the user wouldn't be the end user probably would be the company that receives it maybe because they needed some character set, something, whatever they would need for it. And all the other chips are what you'd expect. Uh, wait a minute, let's take a look at this one. I believe it's this one. It's U17, you can't really get into it uh, too closely. But it is the uh, SRAM. The part is uh, TMS5036. And it is an eight by 64 SRAM chip. In that case, the eight by 64 means that it can hold eight, uh, 64 8-bit words. They call them words, or you you could call them, you know, bytes now. So it can hold 64 bytes. This is 64 bytes of RAM. Finally, let's see, we've got... Uh, a lot of this other stuff is like hex inverters, buffers, uh, what have you. There's something on the corner here, which I'm going to try to point out if I can. Just down by my thumb. We have got a chip that is, uh, although it's labeled, what is the label? It's actually uh, SN75150 um, on the data sheet, but that chip is in fact the one that people more commonly know, know about, the MC1489, which is a dual uh, line receiver chip. It's a chip you can still buy new today, you can get it used, it's been around for ages, so they're still using that. And somewhere buried in here, I'm not quite sure. It is in socket U2, probably somewhere down here. We'll keep an eye out for it. Is another chip that some people might still remember, which is called the 75150, which is a dual line driver. So we've got our receiver here, which I think I said was a dual line. This is a quad receiver. 
and we have a dual line driver. This receives the uh, the serial signals, and the other the other one uh, sends them down the way. And if we can find one here, well, I'll pop the top off, and, and we'll get to the one because there's one that I uh, found in the in the spec sheet, which I found really interesting, and uh, I want to show it to you. But we have to get this guy off first. This whole printer assembly. Now, let's talk about the printer assembly really quick. It's a thermal print head, kind of like you get in a receipt printer, something like that. The big difference between this one is most receipt printers, the print head is the width of the entire paper because the paper is only like that. Uh, but this, the paper is huge. Print heads back then were expensive. So instead, this is a traditional seeking printer with a print head. This is the print head right here, you can see. But it's a thermal print head. So it is uh, still using thermal paper, but it is a seeking head, which is a nice compromise. When I first got this, this thing would not move, and there were some adjustments I had to make. There is a linear motion shaft down here, which, uh, uh, let's get it in frame. There we go. You can see my thumb touching it right there. That just needed some lithium lubrication on there, so I put some lithium grease on that. And then there were some belt tensionings that needed to be done, and then it freed it up, started going beautiful. Uh, finally, while we're up here, can't forget these two big things here. Uh, we've got two stepper motors. This stepper motor controls, let's get this moved down. You can see that that controls the, the printhead. You can see the encoder wheel moving. So it's a stepper with an optical encoder wheel like you'd get in, in a, a mouse with a scroll wheel. And this stepper motor over here controls the paper feed uh, by way of running these pinch rollers. But there's no encoder on here because you can't run the paper backwards. You don't care about that. So why do you need to know where you are? You just need to put the paper one step ahead. Fine. We don't care. Two. So we've got our two steppers here. And finally on the other side here, we've got our uh, big solenoid, which let me actuate this for you. You can sort of see what it does. Watch that. The white plastic. There we go. Push it. If I put... It doesn't move it very much. But when this, act, uh, this uh, solenoid actuates, it moves this whole carriage away and it moves the print head away from the platen. And so that way, when you're at the end of a line and you've typed and typed and typed, and then you hit uh, carriage return, it won't be dragging the print head across the paper, which could uh, tear the paper. It could make the paper go black because of the friction. It could damage wear out the print head. What they do is they engage the solenoid, which pulls the print head away, and then drive the whole assembly back and then disengage the solenoid and the spring pushes it back against the, the uh, platen. Now getting the print assembly off is a lot easier than you, you would have expected in something like this. There are four clips, two here, two here, and all you have to do is push until they click and you can see I've got my camera bolted to the table and that clip is broken on mine and then up we go. And I'm going to disconnect this ribbon cable so that I won't tear it. Um, about this ribbon cable is it's not a, a ribbon cable like the keyboard or like you'd expect to find in in a technology this old. It's actually a, a flexible printed circuit, which was pretty big deal back then. Uh, I don't know if this ever came with a traditional ribbon cable, but the fact that they went to the trouble of using this uh, is really forward thinking. And it goes into this, uh, this uh, standard header connector. While we're talking about header connectors, I want to point out something here. See these uh, header pins? Now, if you've worked on electronics like Arduino stuff, you've seen those forever, but there's something different about them. Let me get one that you're used to seeing. So this is one that I've got in my parts bin. Now you can see this has the plastic carrier on the bottom, whereas this one doesn't. This is all discrete pins. That means that this was uh, put in here in some kind of uh, jig and then soldered either by hand or by wave flow but each pin is discrete and not in a big package like this, which I found really interesting because I never thought that there was another way of doing it until I saw this. I like that. Okay, let's move the print head assembly up. There is a ground wire here, which I don't feel like disconnecting, so I'm not going to, so we're going to, whoa, hey there. We're going to leave the, uh, leave the print assembly just like that, and we'll point some other stuff out. Uh, here it is. This is the one I wanted to tell you about. Now, it's not populated right now. It's U30. Uh, the spec sheet for this labels this as spares. Uh, this is for spare parts. What would go in here would be another uh, SN7406 chip, which is a, um, I think it's a, a, a quad or a, or a hex uh, inverter buffer chip. 
that leads me to believe that this is something that would, or that chip would blow out commonly. And so you needed to have spares available on hand for some reason. It's not soldered anywhere. It's definitely spares. And I'm not sure where it goes on here because all the other logic here is, is soldered. So even if it was a spare, where would you put it? I am not really sure what the point of that is, but it's there. Maybe uh, you could take it out and piggyback it on top of one of these other chips uh, to verify working state. I'm not really sure. Don't really understand a lot about it. And inside we've got more of the same here. We've got um, this, I'm not quite sure what's under this blob of, of hot glue. It's, uh, we've got some things that look like either crystals or big capacitors. I'm guessing those are big capacitors. We've got some uh, diode. This may be something with the voltage rectifier circuitry, but I'm not quite sure. Uh, got some uh, potentiometers, which I'm not going to touch there. We've got two big potentiometers on either side. And one of these adjusts the volume for the acoustic coupler, and the other one adjusts the darkness of the print from the printhead. So it adjusts the, uh, the, uh, the strength of the heater on the thermal printhead. And the final thing to point out, which I just learned a little while ago reading the spec sheet, is we've got some jumper blocks right here, and there's more in the back. And uh, these would be the jumper blocks that you would set if you wanted to change the functions of this device. It was sold in many configurations with many different ROMs, and so depending on what ROM was installed, you'd also uh, change the jumpers around to change its capabilities. Let's take a look at the printer parts really quick before I button this up. Um, I want to point out, stay there, there we go. So I want to point out one of these mounts that the printer rides on, and you can see that they are springs, uh, coil springs in a little cup. This is surprising to me because this is a thermal printer, and thermal printers do not make that much vibration. Uh, they're pretty silent, hence the name Silent 700. Uh, not much vibration, not much uh, anything. So why do they feel the need to shock mount these on springs like that? I don't know, but my guess is that this was originally designed and spec'd with uh, maybe a daisy wheel, but possibly a standard dot matrix printhead. There were other versions um, in the TI Teletype line that had dot matrix printhead. So these could be standard parts from uh, a possible revision of this that they'd never followed through on or pattern parts used in other parts of the, of the, of the other models of the line. And they worked here, they thought, whatever, we've already got them, let's use them. So the springs are not necessary here for a thermal printhead, but they left them and that's a nice feature because it does help keep the print assembly tightened down very snugly. Let's get this big old ribbon cable connected properly. Uh, ooh, okay. And latch this down. Makes a good, satisfying thunk. There we go. Ah, oh, love that. Good, satisfying 1970s sound. Ugh. Now let's take a look at the back, where a lot of the stuff happens that I have no idea about because it's way past my level of expertise. Got your fan here, and I was expecting it to be a uh, an AC induction fan. It's not. It's a 12 volt DC fan. So, whatever. Thought that was interesting. Oh, my computer just made some noise. Hang on. There we go. That'll shut it up. There we go. Sorry about that. And uh, the main pieces you've got here are gigantic capacitors. No idea what they're for. I'm guessing they're part of the power supply. I'm not sure. They could be part of the line drivers as well. Uh, and you've got the main power supply. I know this is the main power supply because in the technical manual, they do this great thing that they used to do way back in the 70s where they have the diagrams of the motherboard and they actually de uh, demarcate out what sections do what. It's really great. Let's take a look at what we got here. Now, the big Charlie right here. This is hard to find specifications on this explicitly, but the manual calls it a multi-voltage transformer. The, the spec number is T301. Uh, T301 does in fact bring up transformers when you look for it, but nothing look like this. But the spec manual says it is a multi-voltage uh, input and multi-voltage output. And it's part of the switch mode power supply system. This is a either the rectifier or the part of the switch mode system as well. Uh, the interesting thing about this power supply is, although you see these things here that you would guess are monolithic voltage regulators, they're not. They're uh, except for one, 
these are all transistors. There's a voltage regulator, I think, the one right at the end. Uh, everything else, all the voltages it needs, the, the positive uh, 15, negative 15, positive 12, negative 12, negative 5, positive 5, they have discrete uh, voltage regulators made out of individual discrete logic here. There's no monolithic uh, voltage regulators except that one right there, which is used, I think, as a reference voltage for everything else, which makes the manual fascinating to read through the way that they did it and how much we take it for granted that I can go on eBay and get a bag of monolithic uh, voltage uh, regulators for pennies, whereas they took up a big chunk of this old motherboard. Fascinating. These transistors here, I'm not going to get close to them, connected to this big piece of metal, which is a heat sink that the fan blows on. Most of these are tip series uh, high voltage or high current uh, transistors. And there's more on the other side. And they are the ones that run the stepper uh, poles. So there's no monolithic uh, stepper driver in this case. They do it all through these, uh, these gigantic tip transistors. Which is something I think a lot of us have probably done when we're playing with like Arduino stuff. But to see it to this level is pretty, pretty interesting. Got your basic power switch over here. Has a nice satisfying thunk and there's not much I can tell you about that other than this is a plastic shell and it's a standard looking power switch under there with a plastic cowl. The most uninteresting thing that I think is interesting is I want to point out this power connector. Now you look at that power connector and think, oh, what's the big deal? That is a standard computer power connector. I've got that on my PC, whatever, what gives? Well, this was designed in the early 1970s. This power connector was like professional grade. It was meant for scientific industrial equipment and to see it on something that was arguably now becoming consumer level, a big deal. And we would start to see that uh, set the standard now for all computer electronics in the future. They all seem to have uh, this plug or some variant of the plug, but I'm betting that this is one of the first mass market devices to carry a plug like this, or at least one at this, at this uh, price point. Another interesting thing to point out about this power switch, let me get the uh, keyboard secured. Let's see if I can oh, get this in frame without bumping the camera. There we go. Now you'll see this power uh, plug here and there's a zip tie here. The zip tie is not connected to the motherboard. Well, sorry, the zip tie is connected to the motherboard, but the power plug is not connected to the motherboard. It goes into these uh, flexible wires. So that means when you plug things in and out of this and this power connector moves, because they always do, it's not going to flex and fatigue solder joints on a board and eventually break them, causing me to have to resolder them. This way, it's completely isolated and you can move it around all you want and it's never going to break these power connections, which I love that. I really like seeing stuff like this because it means you won't have to go through and solder this in a couple of years when the connections fatigue and break. And finally on the back of our device, let's take a look. We've got our power port, which is an EIA port. Uh, it's no idea what that was, but it's a specification that is mostly RS-232 compatible with a different pinout. And it looks really daunting, but it's all in the technical manual. It's really, really easy to figure out what capabilities this has. And with a simple adapter, you can make it talk with anything that speaks RS-232 serial. I have one right here that I made. Finding this connector, which is a uh, DB19 connector, I believe. Yeah, it's a DB19 connector. Now, I was going to order a bunch of, uh, sorry, DB15 connector. I can't count. I was going to order a bunch of these connectors, but then I thought, wait a minute, maybe I'll find one in my parts bin, and in, indeed I did. This is a, a, a joystick, an IBM PC game port connector for an old motherboard that's long gone, but this is one where you would plug this header into the motherboard, and then that has a back panel. But when you plug it in, it is a perfect fit. So chances are, if you have a big parts store, you have some of these already kicking around, they already have a great little connector on the end here, so I went through some standard breakaway header to a new old stock Radio Shack D sub connector, and now I've got something that translates this into uh, RS232 um, 9 pin. Great. This port, though, has some other capabilities in it. Depending on the way the jumpers are set and the ROM you had, you could double your investment by 
having what is connected on this port, uh, instead of just shuttling the data back and forth like you normally would, like a terminal, you could shuttle the data to the acoustic coupler modem, which means this could become an acoustic coupler for your other computer. Uh, you could also, by way of it having this, you could use it as a thermal printer. You could use it as an input-only keyboard because the jumpers can let you bypass the connection of the keyboard to the printer logic and just send the commands down. So you could use it as a terminal keyboard alone for your larger computer. And it was a, probably a great way to justify the cost of this thing back in the 1970s. I have no idea what this thing would have cost, but I can guarantee it was a lot of money. And anything you could do to justify the cost of this would have been really beneficial to help them sell more. Uh, another final note while we're in here talking about old stuff. We've got this uh, this heat sink, and you can see our temperature warning thing. It's stamped in ink on here. Various versions of this, when you look at them online, they will have versions of this that are uh, the uh, they're they're mechanically engraved with like a hand engraver. Uh, they have some that are that are just pressed like dye, like they're uh, they're metal embossed, or you have ones that are just ink printed like this. My guess is that this was the cheaper way to do it. So of course later on, when they switched to the uh, the regular uh, leaf switches from the Hall Effect switches, they also switched to this to get the cost down. Makes perfect sense to me. Now with everything we know of the inside. Why don't we see if this now 40-year-old beast can get up and dance? So I guess I should record this because if I don't, somebody's going to ask for this. Um, this is going to be loading the paper into the silent uh, 700. Uh, this uses thermal uh, paper and it came with a roll that was almost completely empty and so I swapped it out. Um, you can still buy thermal fax paper, but it's easier to go on eBay. The problem is that when you go on eBay, you get a roll like that which is several hundred miles long or something, uh, and it won't physically fit in the little tray here. <laughs> so I will never go through all this thermal paper in my entire life, but it does mean that I can't put the whole spool in by itself. Instead, I have uh, just uh, cut off a small section and I'll thread it in by hand this way. You'll see some dark splotches on it. That's because this thermal paper is new old stock. It uh, is from the early 1990s. Um, I bet the seller is just a use that anybody who actually wanted to buy this. So uh, I bought it because it was cheap and it was more than I'd ever used in my entire life. So to put this in, there's a little uh, spring-loaded bar. You gotta, you gotta raise that. Hang on, I know, I know a secret here. Oh, this makes for great video, huh? Thirty-five minutes of me trying to load a fax machine. Yeah. You millennials today don't know how good you have it. With your plain paper faxes. We don't even have fax machines. Well, you should have fax machines. They were they were terrible. They showed you just how bad life was. So this this little bar here is uh, let me get closer. So you can see my, my adolescent fumblings here. Let's get some light here so that I can see and you can see me mess up. Uh, this little spring loaded bar. Uh, it's meant to uh, keep everything smooth. So I cut it at an angle like this. You can't see that. You can't see that. You're in the wrong place. There we go. And then I feed it in through the edge like this. And that way you can see it's, it's easier to get a, uh, a little corner through than it would be the whole wide thing. And then you gently, gently. There we go. And get that all fed through. Good, all right. The paper is now in, and I will coil up the excess here in the little hopper in the back. As he tries to and fail at coiling up the little paper into the hopper in the back. Yep, all right. There, now it's fixed forever. Oh, and we got we got it tear this off and of course tearing never works with these does it hey it worked that's the first time it ever worked okay we have gone through the outside and the inside of this let's talk about getting this thing hooked up to the uh, modern world papers loaded there first of all of course we've got to plug in our power Ugh. as I bump the camera where awesome 
plug it into the big chunky power supply connector that I love so much and that no grown adult should love that much. Next is, of course, we've got to connect up our uh, serial port. So we're going to plug in the homemade adapter to this 19 pin connector like that. Now we're going to our desktop computer because no computer in the last 15 years has had one of those serial ports. Going through a key span, what does this say? USA 19 HS adapter. These are great. Those other brands probably work just fine, but I like the key spans. Hey, key span, give me free stuff. I'm endorsing you. And we are ready to get this thing connected. But wait, we're not. We got to start talking about some arcane minutia about computers or else this won't work because electrically we're good, but logically data, we're not. We have to talk about port descriptions. So way, way, way back when I started, back when, back in the olden days, back when we had modems and weren't connecting to the internet, we were connecting to BBSs, kids go ask your parents, uh, we would set up our modem on our computer about how fast it was and how we're going to connect to something else with a configuration string that would look like this. I had a 2400 baud modem, which is a little bit faster than this thing. So my configuration was 2400 baud. Boom. Then we had some other things here. We had something they talked about called data bits, which was the setting of how many ones and zeros data bits needed to be transmitted to send one character at this speed. And for my case, I always used, everybody used eight, eight data bits. There, let's make a note here. Data, wow, we cannot even read that. Wow, terrible handwriting, data bits. We had this other thing here next called parity bits. Parity was a very rudimentary error correction made for like noisy phone lines, bad wiring. To be honest, when I came into the game, uh, every, this was all done in software, so we used no parity bits, which was just an N for no. Make our note. Parity bits. And finally, we had something called a stop bit. I'm going to write this preemptively. Now, we always used one stop bit, and this was the bit that was used to let the person on the other end know that we were done transmitting a character. It was going to be one stop bit. And there was one bit which was never talked about, uh, which is called a start bit, which I've never been able to set. I never had to set it because it was always one start bit. So you had one bit to begin your message, eight data bits in it, your parity, which was nothing, and then a stop bit. So we had one, nine, and ten. So ten bits for that to send one character, which is why we can get 240 for that. And throughout my entire life, I've been working with things with modems and serial ports and computers for pretty close to 30 years now. And I always used 8N1. This number over here would change depending on how fast things were. But this was always 8N1. Always 8 parity, eight data bits, no parity, one stop bit. Always. Never even seen anything else. Until this thing shows up. And I try to connect and data doesn't come over right, or it comes over only half the character, or something like that. What, what's going on? So I RTFM'd, read the fine manual, and I found out that the setting is actually different, which I've never had to change before. We know the obvious part, which is 300, because this can work at 300 or 110. Fine. That's not a surprise. Where the surprises begin is the data bits. This is indeed seven data bits. It makes sense when you look at the keyboard. There's no lowercase, there's fewer symbols. This only works on seven bit ASCII, not eight bit ASCII, which also explains why when I would type keys sometimes, only certain keys would come over because it was only sending those keys that were able to be transposed in both character sets. The second thing I've never seen before is parity bits. This thing asks for one parity bit, but I don't know what one parity bit is. Uh, is that is that even parity? Is that odd parity? I don't know. It just says it wants one parity bit. So I did some checking and it turns out it doesn't care even or odd. It just needs a parity bit. So I decided just to do odd parity. And thankfully, thankfully, it still only wants one stop bit. So that's our magic string. 307 odd one. And how many bits per uh, character is this? Well, we've got one start bit, only seven data bits, but we make that up on the parity bit, so we've, we're back up to eight. So one plus seven plus one plus one 
and that should get us up to 10 again. So even though that's different, we're still doing 10 bits to send one character, which makes it easier because we can figure out we're still only doing 30 characters per second. And so we are all connected now. Let's turn this on and get going. And this is where I'm going to cut the video because this is where I'm going to have to redo it a bunch of times. And I don't want to have to do this part again. Here we go. This is what we've all been waiting for. We're going to make this terminal do exactly what it's supposed to do and be a terminal. So let's do our checklist. We've got our paper loaded from our big spool sitting down there because it's too big to fit inside. Power's plugged in. We've got a, a USB to serial connection. Good. And it's going over into a uh, Raspberry Pi, which is going to be the other side of our connection. Because why not? Because they're good for everything. I'm going to get the Raspberry Pi booting. And while it's booting, let's talk about this thing. Remember how I said this didn't uh, have a power light? Because it didn't need one because you knew it was on? Well, yep, that's how you know it's on. So, as the uh, Raspberry Pi is booting, it's going to bring up a uh, console on the serial port that will then set up everything necessary for this thing to come alive. Our uh, little uh, online light will turn on there and we should see something just like that. Boom. So this machine, it's a, uh, this Raspberry Pi is called uh, the Pi Mac because it looks like a little Macintosh. And so that's the Pi Mac. So let's get a little bit closer and log in and we can see what's what. Get some light. There we go. That's not the worst camera angle in the world, so let's do it. All right. So there we go. There's a login name. And then, and enter. There we are. Boy, this thing is really jiggling that camera around, isn't it? There we go. Now the problem we're going to have is that this uh, this terminal can only send things in uppercase. But if I were to do something like W, it says command not found because the command's not found uh, because it's uppercase. So I made a, a little shell script that uh, can be invoked with S that makes uh, gives you a fake shell that takes all of your input that's in uppercase and does it in lowercase. So we're in that now. And now we can do things like W. There we go. That is really jiggling that camera around, isn't it? What other fun things can we do? We can do U name dash A. Oh, what else do we have? We have a uh, df-h. Oh, our paper's getting jammed. Our, we got a paper jam. There we go. Let's get some fresh paper, advance that a little bit. But we can do the most useful thing on any of these, which is we can run bin fortune. Looks like we got a quote from Shakespeare. I think we can do better than that. Merchant of Venice, for all things that are, are with more something chased than enjoyed. I have no idea what that is. All right, finally, let's uh, get something that's really big. Let's do a big old LS. This is a home directory. I know it's got lots of stuff, so let's waste some paper.
I'm trying to hold this camera steady. Vibrations are really incredible. Not my videos with the hairbrush song. So that's it. Um, I guess it's pretty peaked uh, now. Uh, you could use this as your daily uh, machine, but why would you want to? Because uh, there's really not much you can do unless you really enjoy typing in in all caps. So, um, you know what? I guess this is the, uh, the birthday party over for our little uh, terminal. So, from there, I guess uh, we can uh, do a little uh, goodbye. So, echo. Do I have double quotes on here? I do. There we are. Happy birthday, little teletype. And there we are. So thanks for coming along on this journey with me to resurrect our 40-year-old uh, teletype. Okay, here it is, our final last amazing thing. Remember uh, in the video before I said the stretch goal was to make the acoustic coupler on this actually work? Well, it's going to actually work this time. So this is a, a telephone handset back in the days when we had landlines. Uh, I've never used this one, it came with my house. Uh, you can see how old it is, actually you still print as AT&T. Uh, I just have it. So uh, what I've done is I've wired the uh, the speaker side into my computer. And the microphone is going to be disconnected, of course, because we're not gonna worry about two-way communication right now. But the way this works is you seat the phone handset in these, um, in these uh, cups or mufflers, and they really do block the sound. And uh, then it, the teletype will be able to hear the sound of a modem coming through this and print it out. And the sound that we are going to be using is a track from an album that I've had for years. Uh, if you're a child of the 80s, you might remember Information Society had a couple of big hits in the late 80s. This is something from the uh, late 90s, and there's a track on it, track number 10, called White Roses 1.0. And you'll see the end, 308 and 1. Well, from our discussion about how you set up a uh, modem uh, configuration thing, you'll remember that this is a modem configuration string. So what it's telling you is that if you want to uh, listen to this or decode this, you connect it up to a modem and you set it to those parameters, 308 and one. This is not a song. This is modem information telling you where to go get that song. Now, this uh, album is from 1997, so the uh, song is no longer the web address it specifies, but the song has been put online, made free by the artist anyway, if you care that much. But this is going to be a good test to uh, show you how the acoustic coupler works and to prove that it actually works. So I've got it queued up on my computer right now, and I have the handset wired into the computer, and I've got my comedically long roll of paper that will not fit in the back of the teletype. And so let's get moving. I'm going to get everything aligned because this is going to be great. Turn the power on. Okay. And we start the track. The track has a lot of uh, trailer uh, sound in it. It's got 30 seconds of just carrier tone, but I see the carrier light has now come on. So the teletype has received a signal, a carrier signal, and it will start receiving the data. Hopefully, in about five seconds, maybe 10, let's hope. There we go. So as you can see, we had some errors here. Um, that shouldn't be that, it should be something else. Uh, 
that is the correct, correct web address. Uh, that's even the mostly correct password, I believe. There are some typos in here, and this is probably due to the way I've wired up the telephone handset. It's also not a very good handset. Uh, and the fact that this is sending it in 8N1, the teletype is expecting 7, uh, whatever parity, 1. Uh, so there could be some upper ASCII issues, but on the whole, you can see it works. This is what was spit out from the actual sound file. So there's proof. There is the, uh, uh, the, the honesty that the teletype worked, and this shows you just how bad acoustic couplers really were.